Good morning, and welcome to WNHH FM State Line New Haven. I'm your host, Paul Bass, inviting you to look behind the headlines on the stories that make our community tick. Boy, do we have an interesting guest today. Pedro Soto lives in New Haven's Westville neighborhood, grew up here. You may notice that there is snow behind him if you're watching this on Facebook. Little, little snow. <laughs> it's not a fake scene. Pedro is still commuting to work in person while so many of us are sheltered at home because he's doing something the country needs now. He's making stuff for the medical industry. And boy, is that needed more than ever. Pedro Soto, welcome to Dateline New Haven. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for making time. He, Pedro is also the chair of New Haven's Development Commission. So we're going to talk to him today about what his business is doing to try to keep people alive <laughs> and a remnant of the economy humming during the COVID-19 crisis. And then we're going to talk about Development Commission issues in New Haven. And I want to thank Yale New Haven Hospital for providing support for today's program. So Pedro, you uh, used to, you had inherited a manufacturing company in New Haven called Spacecraft that your yep. father started. Yeah. And, and that uh, it was sold and you were working there a while. Now, I didn't realize this until we, just before <laughs> we went on the air. In October, you purchased a manufacturing company called High Grade Precision Technologies. Yes. The state considers you essential. People are still going to work, yep. building stuff. I got a sense maybe you've pivoted on what you're maybe. no it's it's still similar um to what we're doing um so we we do primarily aerospace um lapping and grinding and machining uh but we also have a significant component of uh, medical um uh customers so we have and what do you make for medical customers um we're usually they're sending parts uh for a process called lapping uh, is that L A P P I N G. Yeah, yep. And and, um, and it's just a it's a, when you're trying to get a surface finish that is very 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 fine. And so for medical equipment, sometimes you need to have you know parts that have to be perfectly flat or have a mm -hmm. perfectly smooth surface. Um, so everything from metal to other sorts of plastics, um, we're lapping and, and grinding as well uh, for them. Um, so, so what kind of metal and plastic medical parts? Um, it's, they're hard to describe. Usually they come in, it's usually either like, there's some sort of like medical staple uh, that we're making uh, or we're lapping thousands and thousands of. Um, the other thing is small plastic components that go into medical equipment. So, you know, very, they look like small buttons in some cases or discs or anything, but it's basically a precision engineered piece of plastic that finds its way into some sort of medical device. Um, so this is a field you have in your DNA, which is precision manufacturing yeah. for parts, mostly aerospace. I'm asking you about medical because of what's happening now in the country. Right. You're considered essential. The state says you should stay open. Mm -hmm. Why is that? What um, do you think that's essential? So two things. Um, when there's any sort of um, national crisis, um, on the defense side, defense is required to maintain production. So we hold, um, we're not a direct military supplier, but we have about 191 customers and a significant number of the, of the orders we receive have um, what's called um, sort of DOD ratings. And so the Department of Defense basically flows down a purchase order through the various tiers, right, from the engine maker to the uh, tier one to us, and they basically say on this clause that um, these are rated parts and you must maintain production at all times um, unless we tell you to stop. So that's number one. Um, and number two is um, uh, on the medical side, obviously, we're part of the medical supply chain. And so um, when, Governor Le when Governor Lamont made his announcement on Friday, he did specify that uh, basically aerospace, comma, defense, comma, medical um, supply chains um, must remain open and active. So when you're lapping these metal and plastic precision mm -hmm. process parts for medical equipment, can you tell me about a piece of medical equipment that might be relevant to the fight against COVID-19 or keeping people alive? Yeah. I'll have to look. I mean, I do. One of our um, customers um, who does thermoplastics, precision engineer plastics did say that they have a rush order of thousands of pieces that they need to send us. Um, 
So we didn't ask what the end use was, but we suspect it's for some emergency medical order. I'm uh, sorry, they do ther they make thermoplastics? Yeah, this was a Tyson, uh, Tyson Krupp uh, precision engineered plastics um, contacted us and said that they have a, you know, a, a rush medical order. They didn't tell us where. Um, but, you know, one other thing that's that's interesting that we're we were just approached yesterday, uh, as, as you I think you might know. So I'm the president of the Aerospace Component Manufacturers Association for Connecticut. And I'm sorry, uh, the precision. Um, the, the aero, the ACM, Aerospace Component Manufacturers Association uh, mm -hmm. of Connecticut. And um, we represent about 115 uh, aerospace and defense uh, companies. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we, sorry. It's okay, man. You got busy. You got your phone yeah. ring. <laughs> uh, so um, we were approached as a group by um, Yale New Haven Hospital um, oh. to potentially help with their supply chain issues uh, in terms of making plastic face shields. Um, and these wouldn't be anything uh, really complicated to make. Uh, but they did reach out to us and um, a whole bunch of companies kind of rose their hands up uh, to help assist with this. Would this be uh, instead of N95s? This would be to help reduce the reliance on N95s. So this would be because like sometimes they use N95s in situations where you might yeah, not need the exact. Where you may not need it. Exactly. So um, actually, because we're visual here. Um, it's not that great, but I can kind of show you that it would be something like this. It's all re reversed, but it's a it's like a plastic face shield. And so um, someone from the supply chain of Yale New Haven Hospital reached out because he had an aerospace background and said, you know, these aerospace companies should be able to help. Um, and he had overwhelming response uh, for people to help make these. Um, and on our end, we're about overwhelming. So he just said he had, um, you know, dozens of people start to reach out um, saying. And did he work for Yale New Haven? Is he a Yale New Haven supplier? He works for Yale New Haven. It was his first month on the job uh, for supply chain. Um, and um, so what they're trying to do is see who in, in, uh, in the Connecticut area can help. So right now, actually, um, we met this morning and we're going to be looking to see if we can help, um, if we can source the material materials um because we're pretty good at that um at getting uh you know whatever we need from industrial sources um you know i think uh yale new haven hospital was relying on on amazon trying to get things commercially um so what we're actually doing is trying to um we're, we'll be we're coming up to see if we can help with this process and um, come up with an assembly line and, and help make these masks um, we may not be called to do that right now there may be other companies that are can get up a little faster because they do precision assembly. They do a lot of assembly work, but mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, we're, we're looking to see where we can help as well since we're open and since we're um, able to do things like this. So these are companies that might make other products, maybe even aerospace products that yep. said, we think we can pivot and do this. Yeah. You know, so you're going to get back to you on the Haven talking about if maybe you'll have, some, they have good supply chains where they can order the raw materials for it. Either they could do it um, or if they are having any sort of uh, difficulty procuring materials, um, we might be able to use our aerospace supply chain uh, uh, resources to be able to get, get materials, everything from plastic to foam strips to, to anything. Um, so, I mean, the interesting thing about this whole situation is showing you just how, um, how complicated and important these supply chains are. Um, how many of them reach overseas. Um, so yeah. when you're disrupted, how they really catastrophically collapse. Um, and just to see how, um, you know, how important it is um, in this kind of new reality of potential global disruptions of, of how important supply chains are. Um, they're not going away. It's the only way we can make things at scale is to be able to stretch out how you make these parts um, and where you make these parts. Um, but it's definitely going to be interesting going forward to see how the supply so you chain. The only way we can right. make parts by scale is to have international scale. supply chains. Right. And and that that's proving a little problematic now because of uh, travel or shipping, but also because countries have their own needs. Right. Know? Right. Exactly. So where do you guys um, get your plastic and your foam? 
Um, I mean, usually we have several industrial suppliers. Um, you know, the big industrial catalog of choice is Uline, um, you know, which has a big 500D catalog, but there's about um, seven or eight sources that we can look at um, that are generally, um, you know, you are generally for industrial uses. So we can tap them and see what they have available. And our source we're talking about, about businesses that are still manufacturing, mm -hmm. trying to get us through the COVID-19 crisis is Pedro Soto of Westville. You grew up here too, right? Uh, I grew up in Orange, but I've lived most of my life in New Haven. Most of my life in New Haven. He's the, the chair of New Haven's Dome Commission and the new owner as of October of High Grade Precision Technologies, one of the companies the governor wants to keep open, people going to work. And that's why you see some snow behind Pedro because they're from Playville. <laughs> Pedro, how many people work for you? Uh, we have 29. Does that include everybody? That's everyone, yeah. Are all 29 coming to work? Um, we currently have three people that are home. Uh, so two people decided due to being uh, high risk individuals uh, to stay home. And then one person is a consultant who's also in his 70s who said that he'll just work from home until this is out. Um, and has anybody been sick? No one. No. Nope. Well, that's good. Thank yeah. God. Now, what are you doing to make sure no one gets sick? We're doing everything. How do you build stuff when you can't be six feet near each other? You, you know, the interesting thing with us is that we have a, about a 35,000 square foot facility. So by and large, everyone is about six feet apart. Um, there are a few people that are a little closer, but um, we're pretty spread out. Um, so I've taken a few walks to make sure that that's the case. And people are staying, you know, keeping their distance. Um, we have obviously... Um, you know, hand washing, we're, we're trying to push home, we're wiping down our surfaces, we've, we've prohibited any visitors from coming. Um, you know, we're, we're, um, we have deliveries coming, so we do have trucks coming, however, they're dropping their deliveries at the door. Most of the, most of the companies that are coming also have their own protocols, so everyone is, is sort of taking care of, of themselves as well. What about the people who don't work six feet apart? You said there are a few who are closer? There are a few that are closer. Um, I mean, for everyone, it's just a matter of right, avoiding contact, avoiding common surfaces, um, and just trying to to stay safe that way. Um, How are you feeling, like emotionally, about going to work every day when everybody else is huddled home? Are you? Um, you have a kid. Yeah, I count myself lucky. I mean, we're playing a critical role. Um, it is stressful. I mean, I, I will say that global pandemics was not on my list of risk factors when I um, decided to, to buy a company. Uh, but, you know, right now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm planning. Um, I mean, I count myself fortunate. Uh, I would hate to have been a restaurant that closed with a day's notice. Um, yeah. and, and just all the people that are really hurting economically. Um, but I think that on, on my end here, um, you know, I'm making preparations in case we do shut down. Um, so I have trimmed hours back, both for health reasons and for financial reasons. Um, I applied for a federal disaster loan, um, which is, um, you know, they're they're encouraging um, you know, any company that is 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 currently closed. I do say, please, um, you know, contact, uh, get an SBA uh, disaster loan if you're a small business into the works. You don't have to take the money. Um, there's zero fees. Uh, the process takes a little while, so it's best to, to get things in now. So I submitted that. Um, Have you uh, been hit? Month. Has your company taken any hit? Um, this month, no, um, but I'm monitoring it every day. I think um, I think a hit's coming. Um, I think that uh, there's certain parts are commercial. We do some commercial business, and that's drying up pretty quickly. Um, the aerospace parts are, are actually pretty strong right now. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, you told me that that's really cyclical, if I remember correctly. It is and all um, these big customers, commercial air flight, air airplane companies. They seem to buy in, in several year increments, right? Yeah. So you have peaks and valleys. It's going to be interesting to see how the commercial airline sector gets back on its feet. Um, but with air with aerospace, there's two sides. There's the military side as well that's also been ramping up. Um, so, you know, I think that overall manufacturing won't be severely impacted because I think the defense side will stay pretty strong. Um, but I do think that um, to the extent that we get, you know, back out of this, it'll be interesting to see what the future kind of um, kind of brings on this it. This isn't your bailiwick, but how, how soon do you think we get out of this? <laughs> yeah. 
I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I think right now it's every week begins and ends in a different place. I mean, that's just this, the sense, my sense of time is totally gone, but I mean, I think we're in this for another month at least, if not more, I think. And, and when it comes back, it's not just going to be like, Hey, everyone, you know, get back out there. I think it'll be some sort of phase to thing based on risk factors and based on infection rates and things. So, um, you know, overall, I think that it's, um, I think we're doing the right thing by, by having people stay home. Um, absolutely. Um, and I just hope that, that, you know, the, 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 that we can bend that curve. Yeah, I hope so too. And we're talking to Pedro Soto, who is important behind the scenes, I would say, but under the radar player in what's happened, COVID-19. He's the CEO of High Grade Precision Technologies, a factory with 29 workers. And I guess, is it about 25 on the floor or how many on the floor? Um, we're about... 60% on the floor and then the rest are admin staff. Our game, yeah. Yeah. And they're they're keeping the uh, machines going, making precision parts now, pivoting a little bit to more medical. He's the president of the um, Aerospace Component Manufacturers Association, Connecticut, which is seeing if they can help Yellowhaven Hospital deal with the uh, mask shortage and, and kind of tap their supply their suppliers to, with plastic and foam to make that happen. And I want to pivot to this now. I've been using the word pivot way too much. My wife, <laughs> now. that seems to be the word of the crisis. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of pivoting. To discussion of the um, New Haven Development Commission. Mm -hmm. As a volunteer, you're, you've been on so many boards and commissions over mm -hmm. the years. I, I really admire that about you, Pedro. I mean that. And, um, and you are the chair of the Development Commission. Generally, what you do, if I understand right, is that you get early discussions about plans in the works for development in New Haven, about economic development, what's being built. Has that changed at all in this crisis? Are you folks meeting at all? Are you having informal conversations? And are you looking more at keeping businesses in business? Or is that more the role of the city's economic development office and the economic development commission? It's more the economic development commission right now. We had a March meeting that was canceled. Um, so the April meeting we meet monthly is, is kind of to be determined. We'll probably do a virtual meeting as well. Just to Please get let us know about that so we can uh, cover. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll see once it, uh, it gets out, but I think um, it looks like the mayor has been taking uh, all sorts of, you know, zoom meetings and things. So I think it'll be similar. We've covered the public meetings. They yeah. work. I'm yeah. Just hoping it doesn't become permanent because I'm worried that after, well, this might accelerate the process of our whole world becoming more remote. I know with each other through the intermediary of technology rather than face to face. Yeah, no, I agree. I like face to face as well. So I think hopefully we'll, once we can, and touch. although I think people will be happy to be meeting in person again. So <laughs> there'll be a rush of more. So what about now. development commission? Have you had informal conversations with the city or others about issues? Not, not in the last few weeks. It's been pretty quiet. I mean, I think economic development uh, has been busy itself kind of on there. Stuff mind. still getting built? Are they still working on the projects, the construction crews, or is everyone mm -hmm. sidelined? No, I think construction was specifically um, allowed to continue. Um, so they're, they're still going. Um, Why are I, they doing that? I think there's, this is, you know, not from my professional uh, view, but I think two things. Um, I think that construction projects are very hard to wind down and stop. And I think that half-built buildings um, can't remain kind of half-built um, and left to the exposure. Um, and then I think just there's there's also just the feasibility of um, of projects um, and the financial risk. But um, but yeah, for some reason I think I mean for that reason I think that's why uh, buildings are still continuing to be built. Um, certainly, no new projects will start. Um, I'm assuming. A big issue for folks, you and I have talked about this a lot, mm -hmm. and I love when you weigh in on, on the independent as a comment, <laughs> such intelligent things to say. The airport. Yes. The so Supreme Court has decided mm -hmm. not to hear a challenge to yeah. a federal decision to override a state law right. about the airport. The state had a law that said you can't uh, increase the runway anymore and then have mm -hmm. these other jets come in. And the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, said, we're overruling you. And the state challenged it somewhat reluctantly because of politics. Yeah. But the state said, this isn't just about the airport. This mm -hmm. is about whether some local town or commission or authority can be uh, can sue 
and overrule a state law. So the state oversees local towns and authorities, but the right. local authority jumped and said to the federal government, hey, this is a federal issue, overrule my state. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, this will be a problem for federalism. What do you think? I mean, you know, runways uh, or airports are federal uh, facilities. So I think to the extent that uh, an organization is dictated and governed by a federal authority, um, there are some limitations in terms of what a local um, organization or local body can do to constrain it. Um, I, I, I kind of feel, you know, especially with regulated flight and things like that, um, kind of where do you draw the line? Um, so if, you know, if there's federal requirements or federal um, uh, regulations that allow certain operations at an airport, um, what, what local uh, countermanding could happen that might specifically, um, it, you know, uh, uh, impact its ability to operate as a, uh, under those federal rules. Um, so it's, it's definitely above my pay grade. Uh, but I am, you know, it's, um, I, I, I've been hoping uh, that this would happen for, for a while. Um, I mean, I think that, that this airport is a vital link. Um, I mean, I understand if you live near it, that this isn't what you want to hear. Um, and that there's a lot behind it. I, I think that, um, you know, the arguments that I've always heard against this have been like, well, you know, Tweed's going to fail. It's, it's, it can't do there. You know, there's kind of the two arguments like we don't want additional air traffic, but oh, by the way, it's not worth, uh, you know, attacking. Uh, it's not worth investing in Tweed because it's a failure, but it's like, but if we extend the runway, it won't be a failure. And, you know, there will be, there will be planes there. And I think that, you know, Tweed is in use as a general aviation airport with plenty of jet travel every day. Um, and they're just private jets. They're just as loud uh, as, as normal jets. And I think the number of, of additional commercial planes isn't going to significantly be that many more. Um, I, I mean, I think it'll be several more per day, but, you know, look, graduation weekend, uh, when all the CEOs come and visit their kids in their private planes and land in New Haven, you can see the planes flying in. So, you know, th there, there's, there's a lot of air traffic uh, coming into that airport that is not, has nothing to do with commercial travel. Mayor Justin Elliker mm -hmm. said that he feels that ruling isn't the end to the issue. He feels that before he's going to support any expansion, he wants issues, concerns dealt with with the neighborhood. Have the concerns been dealt with? So Mayor Tony Harp was a little hardcore about the airports. He mm -hmm. said, look, we soundproof people's houses. We have all sorts of plans. We'll keep talking, but we want to go straight ahead. Whereas Justin's been more agnostic about it, saying there are environmental concerns long term. There are neighborhood concerns about right. um, both the environment and, and noise. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure I'm ready to go forward. How do you think that's going to play out and change political dynamic? At City Hall? I mean, that'll be very interesting. I mean, Justin's a pretty thoughtful uh, guy. I mean, I think that, um, you know, he's an environmentalist at heart based on his, his background. Um, and so, you know, I think you could definitely, um, look in those, um, look and balance those concerns. Um, I think he wants a chance to look at it, right. It's his purview. Um, he's new. Uh, and I think that he wants to sort of have the opportunity to weigh in on this. Um, and, and, and make sure that he can make the right decision. So I support that. Um, ultimately, I think that, you know, this airport um, is, is a resource. Um, I mean, I personally think, as, as I think I, I've said that, um, ideally, um, and this is, you know, a broad, my general push to regionalization, New Haven shouldn't really be responsible for managing its own airport. Um, I think the Connecticut Aviation Authority should look at this as a system of airports and be able to kind of manage it that way. And then I think you would have a, a more effective kind of transportation uh, policy in terms of, of, of airplanes and in terms of commercial flight. Um, but I think that, um, you know, I guess if this, if for, for where I see it is that if you're not gonna extend the runway, um, then you're kind of eliminating Air, uh, Bradley as a significant commercial airport and if you, or Bradley, sorry, Tweed. And if you do that and you're still owning the airport, then what's the city going to do long-term with it? Um, and, and are you going to continue funding it or can you get it to a point where it's more self-sufficient by adding uh, commercial travel? So there's the economic and, and there's the environmental side, but um, you know, I think that ultimately it's going to come to a head in either direction. Mm -hmm. Pedro Soto, thanks for chatting with us today. I want to ask what your next steps are. What are going to be the next steps with 
your company and in your personal life with how you and your family are dealing with the COVID-19 crisis? Um, you know, we're staying, um, you know, my wife and, and daughter are staying home. And uh, I saw you walking around the neighborhood as I was walking yeah, around the neighborhood yeah. the other day. Very nice. People are out on the street. I yeah. for half an hour. I see so many people. That's kind yeah, of yeah. We, we saw we that to too. I hope. That, you know, like, yeah, you, you kind of stay your distance and stuff. Yeah. But the walking is nice, and, and you know, it's nice to be reminded that we live in a neighborhood with sidewalks that we're not kind of isolated on our own little islands as long as now we keep our distance. Um, but I think that you know. Um, uh, spring break was this week, uh, and last week, and we were supposed to be in Puerto Rico. Uh, so we're clearly not there. Um, but next week school starts. So we'll kind of see how that, how that plays out. Right. That's a big, and is your yeah. wife at home? During, yeah. And, okay. Yeah. And so, um, so we'll, we'll kind of see how, how that plays out. Um, you know, on this end, I take it, I, I kind of take this every, you know, I feel very strongly that as long as my employees are here um, and as long as I'm asymptomatic and don't have any symptoms and don't have a fever that um, I need to be into, at work for my employees. Um, so I think it's important for that. Um, and I have told everyone, you know, if, you, if you're uncomfortable, you can stay home. Um, there will be, you know, I'm looking at, I mean, right now a lot of my time is spent just digesting all of these laws and all of these new regulations and all of this, you know, the federal sick leave law, um, you know, whatever this thing that they're going to pass uh, at Congress in terms of business interruption insurance or business interruption loans and things um, so that at least I'm ready. Um, and that, you know, because I have a, I, I, I have a runway because we're still opening, uh, we're still open, but I need to make plans in case um, that happens in case we do end up some, suddenly shutting down. Well, good luck with those plans. Thanks. I have to say, I always love talking to you, Pedro. I always feel lucky when you comment the independent oh, and come on the radio. <laughs> I consider you one of the great citizens of New Haven. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And best of luck with with um, high-grade precision technologies. Hey, do thanks. you guys have any photos of people on the uh, doing the work these days? We'll publish one on the independent. You can email Um them. Yeah, let me see. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to my um, marketing person and see. Yeah. And We'd practice. love to show people at work. Yeah. Playing film. And uh, thanks for joining us today, everyone, on Dateline New Haven. Thank you. I thank our station here, the uh, brilliant Harry Droz, who keeps us on a million platforms at once. <laughs> I want to thank Yellow Haven Hospital for providing support for today's program. They'll hopefully be getting some new masks, courtesy of the Aerospace Manufacturing Association, Connecticut. And Harry, I guess we're going to take it out with the Afro Semitic experience playing um, I Wish I Knew How It Would Feel to Be Free. <laughs> In the group CD, A Plea for Peace. This is Paul Glass inviting you to fly free with us all day and all night. WNH8 FM State Line in Take care. Bye.